All right, welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. We're so pleased you can be here. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be speaking about the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network and the Northeast uh, Coastal Acidification Network. And we're so pleased to have uh, Katie Goldsmith uh, here today from the from MACAM, the Mid-Atlantic Network, and Rue Morrison from NECAN, the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network. Um, before we get launch into learning more about the work of these networks, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions uh, of our presenters. So there, you, you can type in questions either through the chat panel or through the question and answer. Um, you have the option with the chat panel of also just sending out information or making your questions visible to everyone or sending information to everyone in the webinar. Um, and so we do, uh, if you have information relevant to the webinar, feel free to do that. Um, but we just ask that you use discretion and use it professionally in terms of using that, the, the broadcast to everyone in the webinar. Um, Q&A questions uh, sent to the Q&A panel will just go to the, the presenters. Okay, well thank you so much Katie and Rue. Katie, I'll turn it over to you now. All right, thanks Sarah, thanks for having me today. Good afternoon everyone. Um, as Sarah said, I'm Katie Goldsmith. I'm the program manager at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, and I co-lead the Mid-Atlantic Coastal Acidification Network, or MACAN, with Grace Saba, who is an assistant professor at Rutgers University and the Ocean Acidification Innovation Lead for the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association Coastal Ocean Observing System. And real brief, MACAN is a nexus of interested stakeholders who are seeking to coordinate and guide regional observing research and modeling of ocean and coastal acidification in our region. But before I dive deeper into MACAN, I just want to take us a step back and talk a little bit more broadly about coastal acidification networks in general. Um, we're not alone, as you know, because NECAN will be presenting shortly. Um, but there are coastal acidification networks across the United States. And we uh, seek to create these cooperative regional approaches to fostering collaboration around the topic of coastal and ocean acidification. We encourage sharing of information and best practices so that we can advance mutually agreed upon goals and objectives, and ultimately strive to make more effective use of limited resources by focusing those resources on the highest regional priorities and reducing duplicative efforts. So diving back into MACAN, we initiated our network first by pulling together a diverse group of steering committee members from research industry and natural resource management. The steering committee consists of 13 members, all of which are on your screen now, along with their affiliations. The MACAN region runs from New York south of Long Island down through Virginia, and our region is bordered to the north by the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network, NECAN, and to the south by SOCAN, which is the Southeast Ocean and Coastal Acidification Network. And when we first established, MACAN developed a series of objectives that we wanted to help guide the network in the coming years. And uh, these included to develop a regionally relevant education and outreach and engagement strategy and informational website, to provide an information hub to share acidification resources in the Mid-Atlantic, as well as to connect researchers and share research. We also wanted to provide a forum to share best practices and monitoring and sample collection and to develop a list of regionally impacted species and identify regional research gaps. So for the rest of the presentation here, I'm going to dive into the various products that we have pulled together in the past few years since MACAN's inception to get at these objectives. Um, and I'm going to start with products that are more finalized, you know, things that had a, a real big push and, and are now sort of in maintenance mode that we update regularly, but are, are more or less, you know, operational. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some products that we have that should be coming out fairly soon in the near term. And then I'll end with something that we're kind of on the precipice of really diving into um, for, for the network for the region. 
So the first product that I wanted to talk about is our website, which really kind of gets at that first objective that I just mentioned, as well as many of the others. Um, and this website was one of the first things that we developed, and it includes information about what are the basics about how uh, acidification is impacting the mid-Atlantic estuaries, our coasts, and the ocean, um, as well as what we know about impacts or potential impacts to various species. Um, in the region, it also has information about monitoring and, and what, you know, what monitoring um, is relevant for acidification and why that matters for the region. It also has a resources page that provides a list of various pub publications that um, are specific to the Mid-Atlantic region, as well as a lot, a lot of other information. Um, and I also want to highlight that there's a news and events section there where we try to highlight things that are happening um, that are coming out, such as grant opportunities or new monitoring sites, or you can see in the bottom left of the screen there, we developed a fact sheet around monitoring acidification in the mid-Atlantic. So that's kind of a place where we really try to, um, as I said, that's sort of the, the regular maintenance of the site is trying to keep it up to date with, with new things that are coming online, um, really to try to get at that goal of being this information hub for the region around the topic of, of ocean coastal acidification. Another one of the big priorities that we had in the initiation of MACAN was to develop um, a map depicting current, past, and ongoing acidification monitoring efforts in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, you know, under, under the concept of we wanted to understand where we are now so that we have a good place to stand as we try to figure out where do we want to go. And we pulled this map together by reaching out to the community to gather their information. And this is now live on the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal's website, which is that link that you see at the top of the screen. Um, and these efforts, these monitoring efforts, um, include but are not limited to academic research, water quality monitoring for state natural resource agencies, federal research, and monitoring by commercial shellfish industry. The different colors on the map represent different types of sampling. So as you can see, continuous monitoring sites are in this kind of orangey color. Um, and those sites tend to be buoys with um, with um, sensors attached to them. Cruises are in blue here, ongoing fixations in green. Um, those tend to be most commonly discrete water sampling sites where um, bottle samples are taken and then sent to a lab for analysis. And then former fixations are um, very similar to ongoing fixations with the big exception of that they are no longer in operation. So there's some good historical data there for a variety of purposes, but to our knowledge, they are not active monitoring sites. Um, so, and as I said, MACAN has been using these maps to help us identify where are the monitoring gaps and determine ideal locations for leveraging sampling and creating a more robust monitoring network for the region. Um, additionally, we have made these maps interactive. So if you click on a site, you can see uh, that a little window pops up, which is the image you see on the right hand side there that gives some metadata information about that site. So as you can see for this example, where the little red balloon is popped up, um, this is telling us that that site is an ongoing fixation. It's operated by the Chesapeake Bay program. They have a name for it. Um, and at this particular site, they are monitoring of the, of the four carbonate chemistry parameters that are currently measurable they are monitoring for pH. So they're not monitoring for dissolved inorganic carbon, total alkalinity, or partial pressure uh, carbon dioxide. 
They are monitoring some other parameters, including oxygen, temperature, salinity, et cetera. And that is relevant for us to understand potential drivers at a given location, as well as um, other stressors that could be interacting with acidification. So those are important to know as far as being able to conduct some, some research or, or develop um, laboratory research studies. And then we see that this site, the time frame, um, this does have a, quite a, a historical time set. It starts in 1984 and continues to today. And then there will be a link to um, where you can find more information about the data or perhaps download the data um, or, you know, just in general where that data can be found. And so at first glance of this map, it it looks like the acidification, um, excuse me, the Mid-Atlantic is well sampled for acidification. But if you look deeper, obvious gaps in the monitoring start to appear. So one thing that we started to notice with this map is that with the exception of a few fixed autonomous stations, the sampling frequency throughout much of the region is too low to adequately capture short-term episodic events. Um, and this is important because these could pose more acute, immediate concerns to impacted industries and managers. Um, and for instance, the cruise tracks that you see, those blue lines, um, those are occurring about once every four years. So there, there's a limitation in the temporal resolution of the data. So we also developed, uh, we took the same information from that map that you just saw on the previous two slides and sort of parsed it out into some different ways to look at that data so that we could again start to identify where the gaps might exist. And we started by um, seeing, developing the four maps that you see in the bottom left hand corner of the screen there. It's one map for each of the four carbonate chemistry parameters that we can currently measure. And then we also developed this map on the right hand side, which tells us the number of parameters that are being measured per site. Um, and what these tell us is that even in cases where high frequency resolution observations are being recorded, it is common that only one acidification parameter, such as pH, is being measured. And uh, the complication there is that this does not allow the full characterization of the carbonate chemistry of, of acidification, including the aragonite saturation states um, that can directly impact organisms that build calcified structures. So again, we see you know, this limits the utility of the data that we currently have for the region. Something else we noticed um, is that most sampling is done at the surface in this region, but subsurface waters are typically more acidic due to the biological process of remineralizing sinking particulate, organic surface material. Um, in the bottom left there, you see in this figure, um, a recent NOAA ocean acidification program funded East Coast ocean acidification cruise from the summer of 2015 was dedicated to acidification focused carbonate chemistry measurements. And this survey revealed the existence of low pH water in bottom cold pool waters in the mid-Atlantic bite shelf. So you see um, in this figure, there are vertical sections of on the top pH and on the bottom temperature from a cross shelf transect in New Jersey, where you kind of see that matching up of the cold water temperature and the lower pH values. And then on the right here, um, there were pH glider transects conducted in May of 2018, which show high resolution pH measurements on, in the cross shelf of New Jersey. And we see freshwater influencing lower pH conditions in shallow waters, as well as low pH in the cold pool waters again. Um, and then we see higher pH at the chlorophyll maximum due to photosynthesis and at shelf break associated with warm, salty water mass. 
Okay, so from those maps and, and from you know, what we started to understand in terms of the data gaps, we then pulled together a work group within MAKECAN to present considerations for developing monitoring that addresses these gaps and considers best practices in order to improve the understanding of carbonate chemistry variability and change in the region. Um, this information is presented in a white paper format, which is not quite available, but we're hoping should be in the coming months. Um, I will mention in the meantime, we did do a presentation to our network to get some feedback from them on some of the preliminary findings that we were bringing up in the paper. And you can um, actually see a recording of that webinar on our website at midacan.org slash webinars if you are anxious and want to get the information or at least, you know, preliminary results of that information before the white paper is officially available. Um, and I'll also note that um, this white paper has been reviewed through an additional group of external, external experts who are on the MACAN network, but were not on the work group itself. Um, and those as well were from uh, diverse sectors as well as the, the authorship or the work group members themselves. And then similarly, over the past year, we have been working to identify research gaps in the understanding of regional acidification impacts that we hope will be used as a framework for researchers to focus future efforts in the region. We uh, developed these or identified these gaps through a work group as well. The work group membership are the names listed here. Um, and though this is also presented in a white paper format, which organizes the topics around the um, eight subjects you see on the bottom right hand screen there. And similar to the previous white paper, it's not quite available yet. We're hoping it will be in the coming months. Um, but in the meantime, we did present preliminary information uh, on this in a webinar format, which you can also see on uh, the website midacan.org slash webinars. Um, and also this has been reviewed through uh, some external experts on the network who did not, who weren't on the work group itself. Um, so a couple of products that are hopefully coming out soon that we're really excited about. Um, and yeah, more to come on those. And Great. then, thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to um, touch on a product that we are in on the precipice of diving into, but haven't quite um, gotten into yet. And this is our outreach strategy. We have two goals for this. We're first um, working to increase engagement of existing network members through um, some survey work. We have a, a variety of members who are currently quite engaged and we just want to kind of understand how can we focus the topics that we um, do our webinars on or, or things that we post on the website or work groups that we pull together. How can we get those to be even more responsive to our network members and what they're interested in and why they join the network to begin with. Um, and then in a similar vein, our second goal is to gain a better understanding of potential industry impacts and concerns related to coastal and ocean acidification. We've done this to varying degrees through workshops and webinars, but we really wanted to do a more concentrated effort on this so that we can, again, make sure that we are um, conducting webinars and, and updating the website in a way that really gets to um, the questions that this region has around this topic. And uh, I'll just leave us with um, a couple opportunities to engage if you're interested in continuing to, you know, learn more about the Mid-Atlantic region or guide the conversation. Um, our website is, of course, a great place to start, but also the listserv provides a lot of great um, information about, again, you know, upcoming opportunities, grants, monitoring that's coming online, things of that nature. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, we've got webinar series that run. Um, usually, they, they, we have traditionally run them between December and March with a webinar each month um, that we try to target around the interests of our network. And then um, attending in-person workshop, 
We are hoping to have uh, another workshop coming up soon here. We hosted our first one a few years ago, so that'll be a good place to engage. And then finally, on um, work groups. As I mentioned, a lot of the products that I just talked about were developed via work groups um, in the network. So if you're interested in kind of coordinating the conversation and, and diving in deep, um, those are great ways to do that. So with that, I'll just say um, you can, if you're interested in, in reaching out to us or joining the listserv, you can email me or grace at info at midacan.org. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Ruth. Okay, thank you, Katie. Okay, I'm just firing up the screen sharing here. And okay. start presentation. That's good. We, yep. Okay. We see the NECAN side. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk about NECAN, the Northeast Coastal Acidification Network. Uh, what I'm going to show and say is a combination of my work, Emily Silver, who is the coordinator for NECAN, and many others, including a great steering committee, uh, and all the members of the working group. So, uh, it's thanks to everybody else. Just to let you know, I am the executive director of NIRACUS, which is the Northeast Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems, so the IUS region in the Northeast. So NECAN is very surprisingly, well not really, is very similar to MECAN. It brings everybody together. It's a nexus. There's a great word that has been repeated. Uh, it kind of, from people who are interested in looking at the coastal ocean, and really kind of trying to guide the same things as they can, kind of observing research and modeling, all with an eye on what are the practical implications of uh, ocean and coastal acidification as we move forward. And so NECAN up here, we really think of as being everybody that is interested in the ocean. We can, there's a part for everybody to play. And one of the greatest ways that people are engaging with us and with everybody else is through our working groups. So we have four of those, a science working group, an industry working group, a policy working group, and an outreach and education working group. And those have been working hard to produce a lot of good products and to move the conversation forward. Uh, there is a lot of overlap uh, in some of, in quite a few of the areas that are thought about and considered by these working groups, and that is kind of brought together at the steering committee level, where a chair of each of the uh, working groups is a member of the steering committee. We thought it was important when we set out to really kind of say what we will do and what we won't do. So, um, you know, we kind of pull people together. Um, provide guidance, kind of information products, organize workshops, uh, kind of resources for stakeholders and, uh, and policymakers, but we don't actually undergo any kind of research or monitoring ourselves, though some of our members do, and we don't provide any funds to anybody to do anything. Uh, so what we see is our, our role is to kind of review, assess, and communicate what's going on, uh, to communicate uh, the critical knowledge gaps, uh, to coordinate research, uh, to identify regional priorities, to document and respond to uh, stakeholder needs, and to kind of educate people about uh, the coastal acidification research and what's going on up here in the Northeast. So very similar, as you would expect, to what MECAN is doing. And what have we done to date? Well, we started this uh, in 2013 with a series of webinars that went into 2014, and then we had a state of the science workshop in April of 2014. This resulted in a summary article uh, uh, that was published in uh, the next year, and we've also had a series of stakeholder workshops and published the first draft of our implementation plan in 2017. The State of the Science Synthesis uh, document uh, brought together a number of people for a few days uh, to develop it, uh, and you can see it here. Uh, you can see that there are kind of some of the key take-home messages uh, and about buffering capacity, nutrient loading, the temperature of the water, 
the importance of regional fisheries uh, and and how we're looking at things uh, up here in the northeast. Similar to uh, MACAM, we've also done an inventory of kind of modeling and uh, monitoring in the northeast. And uh, this is a, a very similar sort of map to what you saw in Katie's presentation. The difference here, though, is if you can see there's a, a, a sampling frequency scale up in the legend, so the coloring of the uh, of the tracks or the or the individual marks on the map actually indicate uh, the kind of frequency of uh, so most of this is a very low frequency uh, and we're not really capturing the episodic events uh, since we started NECAN in 2013 we've actually seen an increase of continuous uh, monitoring sites from one to about uh, six or seven right now uh, so that's good news. Uh, but there's still a lot of gaps out there. Uh, the regional monitoring can be from things uh, kind of from to from things such as the Appledore Island uh, CO2 station that is part of uh, NOAA's Ocean Observing Network, um, and and it really allows uh, people to dive in and understand local processes. Uh, and it's necessary to kind of really uh, develop. Uh, predictive models and assess the impacts. Like MACAN, NECAN has a great website where you can go and find out all sorts of information about the webinars, about ocean and coastal acidification up here in the Northeast. Uh, there's a bibliography. You can find all the publications that we've found so far on uh, ocean, ocean and coastal acidification in the, in the region and, and around, organized by a whole load of different themes. You can also find this informational and fun um, video that we, uh, with a load of partners, produced. And uh, it's great ways to find out more about ocean and coastal acidification. As I said, we've also done about six uh, uh, stakeholder engagement meetings from Connecticut up to uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, we also helped with uh, some work in uh, in the Middle Atlantic before MACAN got stood up uh, and used some of the resources we developed to enable them to hold uh, a stakeholder engagement workshop. And uh, a synthesis of, of all of these workshop materials uh, has been completed, and you can find that on the NECAM website. As part of that, there's a kind of some uh, synthesis of the stakeholder concerns. Uh, from you know a, a various different suite of things that people are interested in learning more about and, and find particularly uh, problem, uh, um, particularly a uh, particular problem, and uh, you can see some of the things there that are up on the screen and the great group of people that we always get together at any of these uh, stakeholder meetings. We also use these meetings to identify stakeholder uh, research needs. And you can see a number of them there. One of the things that keeps on coming up is the kind of need for long-term monitoring and continuous data sets and standardizing uh, research and monitoring approaches. Uh, you, can, uh, you can read the list, and this uh, presentation uh, will be available to anybody who wants it. Um, but we also were lucky enough to work with uh, the Northeast uh, Region Sea Grant Consortium as well as NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, who uh, issued an RFP to look at um, some of the, the, the uh, concerns that had been brought up in our process. And so these th four projects were funded a couple of years ago uh, to actually really dive into the research priorities that we had identified. So that for, for us, that was showing that we're actually moving in the right direction. We also kind of have identified some of the, uh, the challenges and, and needs associated with communication. And, and it is important to kind of focus on a, a lot of different things, but not too much on scientific uncertainty and, and opportunities for kind of the community action and, and not just uh, the kind of on scientific uncertainty. Uh, and, and one of the things that we also did is work with our local regional partnership uh, ocean partnership up here, NROC, to host a workshop 
to try and help uh, develop a coordinated monitoring strategy uh, to help us better understand ocean and coastal acidification up here in the Northeast. One of the other things that we've been um, working on this year is uh, looking at, at uh, citizen science monitoring and how to better integrate and to, uh, to use those groups and to enable them to make the best measurements possible. This was brought about because uh, we were able, uh, the EPA published some guidelines for measuring changes in sea water and pH associated with carbonate chemistry. Uh, so that was something that was identified early on in the stakeholder process was the need for these guidelines. The EPA were great. They stepped up and, and uh, developed the guidelines. And then these were used uh, to really talk with people about the best ways to make uh, citizen science measurements in the Northeast. Uh, so what we did was it brought together kind of small groups of people for day-long conferences to talk about what was going on and hands-on experience, a uh, series of presentations in the morning, talking about a number of different ways and techniques uh, and regional examples, and then uh, kind of afternoon, the description of the parameters and protocols uh, and ways to kind of to use uh, equipment for monitoring. And these workshops took place in Connecticut, Maine, and Massachusetts with a goal of taking the groups of people that were there, providing them with the materials and resources, and helping them to disseminate out beyond the workshop participants to others uh, to spread this knowledge. We've also worked with MACAN uh, to develop a, this kind of joint regional understanding about, um, uh, about uh, ocean acidification and to build conceptual models uh, to compare and contrast what's happening in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, so this is a project that's still ongo ongoing. We are in the middle of an industry webinar series. Uh, we've talked about sediment saturation state, uh, coastal change impacts, ocean and coastal impacts on shellfish hatcheries. Uh, later this week, we'll be learning a bit more about muscle thistle thread strength. Uh, that's on Thursday, and a few other things that are lined up that you can see there, including impacts on lobsters. Uh, other uh, activities that we've got in the pipeline uh, and what we're trying to fund uh, is the Citizen Science Shell Day, uh, kind of a, a kind of single day blitz looking at total alkalinity in the region. Uh, we're hoping to kind of spin this up in the next year. Uh, and it's kind of using the citizen science groups and researchers as regional hubs to bring everybody together to get that regional uh, kind of look snapshot of total alkalinity close to the coast. And this was really an outgrowth out of those citizen science workshops as one of the recommendations. Uh, so some great people have pulled this together. Esperanza and Parker really worked very hard on it as has uh, Chris Hunt from uh, UNH, Esperanza, and, and Parker are up in uh, the University of Maine and with Sea Grant. And so this is something that we hope to see next year. We also have our implementation plan that is uh, guiding us. And there are some of the bits that we, uh, we've thought about doing, uh, including a data integration workshop uh, to really bring people together. Uh, we had a, stake, uh, a steering committee meeting on Friday and we decided that we didn't like the way we uh, laid it out. So the working groups themselves are actually going to go back and look at this. So this is kind of like a work in progress. Uh, we're going to see an updated implementation plan that are going to, that is uh, going to guide our future activities. Uh, and we hope to have that ready to go very early in the new year. And then one last thing that is a great resource for anybody interested in ocean and coastal acidification is this Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. You can see the website at the bottom. It's a great place to join other people interested uh, in, in this subject and to bring people together to discuss what's going on. You can ask questions of others. You can share resources and information and experience. You can collaborate. And you can follow the latest conferences, workshops, and webinars. So if you haven't signed up for that already, please do so. And then lastly, I'll just leave you with 
uh, my information, Katie's information, and then some more information about the ocean acidification uh, website down the bottom. Okay. Thank you, Rue. Uh, this was great to learn more about Nikan. And thank you, Katie. So uh, just remind everyone how to ask questions. You can type the questions either into the chat panel or the question and answer. And you can also, if there's some information you wanted to provide to the group, you can go ahead and send that to everybody on the webinar uh, through the chat. Uh, so we have a couple questions. Um, one was a, a clarifying question about uh, one of your slides, Katie, uh, and that was whether the New Jersey DEP uh, continuous moni monitoring sites are included in your work. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that means on the, on the maps, the monitoring site maps, and um, we, in, as I said, in the initiation of, of developing that map, we reached out to a lot of folks, and in, in New Jersey's DEP, we reached out to um, off the top of my head, I want to say Bob Schuster and Bruce Friedman to get their data on what uh, wa water monitoring sites they had in New Jersey. So we gained all of that information from them and included it on the map. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question was originally directed at you, Katie, but I think it would be interesting to hear from both of you. Um, does your network consist of mainly scientists or does it also include concerned citizens? And I guess I would add to that, what about industry and, and other groups? Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll kick it off. Um, we, I would say that the, there is a good portion of the network that includes scientists, but that includes scientists from, you know, various state, federal, tribal agencies, as well as academia. Um, and then, but then there is also, you know, a variety of industry folks um, from shellfish community, commercial fishing. Um, and I would say that to a lesser extent are the, the uh, concerned citizens, but there are some on the listserv that, that are just concerned citizens. And I think that we're interested in their perspective as much as any other. Okay, thank you. And uh, Rue, did you want to add anything about the composition of Nikan? Um, I would agree with what Katie said, uh, but it also depends on which of our working groups you're talking about. If, if it's kind of the science working group, you've got a lot of researchers in there. Um, but in the industry working group, that really is a lot of in engaged industry people. Um, the kind of policy and management working group has uh, a, a mixture of people, uh, including a lot of the coastal managers uh, up here. Uh, and then outreach is, is kind of a mixture of different people. I, uh, and I think, as Katie said, on our main kind of list, uh, uh, we have some uh, kind of um, interested public as well. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, and a question from Jesse. Uh, how do state agencies engage in workshops, webinars, et cetera? What does future regional and government coordination look like in 2019? You want to go Rue first? Sure. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, we had a, a great workshop with NROC, the Northeast Regional Ocean Council up here that included a lot of our coastal management community folks um, talking about this. Uh, a great place, presumably, for all of, all for both regions is to really engage with the working groups. I know on the policy and management working group, uh, we've got a lot of representation from state agencies there. Um, and then to sign up um, kind of for any of the listservs uh, to get uh, information on future uh, workshops and, and ways to engage. Okay. Katie, did you want to add? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I, I think Rue is right on, and, and I would just add that, um, you know, Rue mentioned they're working with NROC up north. They are, you know, the, the entity that I actually work for, MARCO, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean. Um, they're our sister organization to the north of us, so that that is a, a good way to get, um, you know, to try to pull in the agency folks who are most interested, which can vary, you know, it depends on the topic that they're working on. Um, so that kind of depends on, you know, how we engage them in different workshops and webinars, making sure that we're actually 
um, inviting them to things that are relevant to what their interest and what they are um, required to do by their position or by their governmental policies and practices. Okay, great. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in this uh, intersection with uh, state policy. I don't know if you can see in the chat that there's two additional questions uh, in, in this vein. Um, I'll read one of them. Um, Given the trend towards increasing acidification, how are the results of your monitoring work being used to influence the political agenda to reverse this trend? Is there anything else you wanted to add from your previous discussions to this? Sure. Well, I, could, uh, oh, Karen, Katie. <laughs> um, I would just say that, you know, Macon itself is not actively um, pursuing any policy actions, but um, certainly, you know, we try to um, coordinate the development of research or information gathering that targets questions that management and policy entities or individuals have. Um, so I think it, it kind of comes back to that role of how do we coordinate um, efforts around the biggest questions in the region? How do we make sure that resources are being used efficiently to target those questions so that, you know, we can answer those questions for perhaps decision makers, um, but we ourselves do not pursue any policy actions. That's pretty much what I was going to say. And in fact, um, <laughs> You know, sometimes the policy and management working group gets kind of quite uh, excited about particular things and we have to say, no, you can't actually say that with a NECAN hat on, uh, but, you know, please go out and say that with your own institution's hat on. But it's something that, that, that you know, we're not going to participate in. We'll provide information to state commissions. We'll do as much as we can to help, but it's not our job to actually make policy or to uh, suggest the policy. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I think you mentioned that there was, but is there a network uh, for ocean acidification in the South Atlantic, including Florida? Yeah, so F Florida is shared um, between GCAN, the Gulf uh, Coastal Acidification Network, and SOCAN, the Southeast Coastal Acidification Network. Um, it's kind of, you know, SOCAN gets the eastern side of Florida to some extent. They overlap a lot. Um, and then GCAN kind of gets the Western side. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the question for Rue, uh, what have you found to be particularly successful techniques or strategies in reaching out to industry members? Uh, the best thing is to get industry members to reach out to their peers. Um, that's how we found uh, the kind of most success. Um, having said that, um, this may not be the highest priority on some of the industry uh, kind of uh, kind of trag uh, um, things that they're trying to tackle right now. Uh, there are many other things maybe apart from uh, ocean and coastal acidification that uh, kind of cause them concern. Uh, and so we've got to find a way to really get them to think about it uh, kind of in a, as a long-term issue and one that does uh, deserve their time. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, a question, because I'm going to alter it a little. Um, when you talk about your outreach, um, who is it targeted at? Is it more at industry and managers uh, so that they would think more about ocean acidification, or is it more about awareness for the general public? For us in the Northeast, it's mainly been uh, well, it, it depends on what you're using, but it's uh, the actual workshops we've had. We've been looking at uh, kind of industry, uh, people who fish, aquaculture, that sort of thing, as well as um, coastal managers and coastal water quality programs, uh, really targeting those to look at, you know, ways that it might impact them or the ways that they may be able to do things to help. Um, but then other things like the video and the other stuff are really kind of designed for general public and others who are interested. So uh, different approaches for different audiences. Okay, Katie, did yeah. you want to? Yeah, so I would just add, I mean, I think Rue's right on, and I would just add that um, I think for us, and I would say for NECAN as well, um, we try to focus on 
really, you know, our outreach efforts focus on getting information from those individuals first and foremost, and then responding to questions, responding to what are their burning, you know, what do they really want to know, um, and, and try to focus any sort of outreach effort that we pull together around what we're learning from them first and foremost. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, Katie and Rue, did you have anything else you wanted to add? We don't have any more questions at this time, so we'll, we'll end a few minutes early, but is there anything you wanted to follow up with? No, just a um, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you to you, but also kind of thank you to kind of two uh, programs that are kind of at a federal level that have really enabled this to happen, one of which is NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, uh, they were involved in all of the cans. They really em encouraged us to kind of do this uh, and help. And the other is uh, the uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System. I use uh, the program office um, uh, with which a lot of the cans are associated. So um, kind of without those two groups, we wouldn't be lucky enough to have regional coastal acidification networks. Here, here. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then we had some thanks coming into the chat uh, for the webinar. Okay. Um, I, well, one last, there was another uh, sort of comment question, uh, and that was, I've been noticing the sailing community is starting to accept more of the ocean science that the scientific community is publishing. Is there any interest in setting up a booth at any of the sailing shows? I know Annapolis is this week, Newport is in the future, and Miami is the largest. So, it's another thought for outreach for you guys if you're not already there yeah that it's an interesting idea and that is we are certainly trying to get some more information from um kind of the recreational boater charter boater community in addition to um the other industries that we've talked about um they're definitely a, a an interested stakeholder that we we consider Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you guys. We so appreciate you presenting today and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, I, I apologize for the laughs in introducing myself at the beginning, but I'm Sarah Carr and I coordinate the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureSurf. Uh, so we host uh, webinars two to three times a month and we hope you can join us for some of our webinars in the future. Uh, thank you everyone and I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day wherever you are.